us. So I just want to first start um, by acknowledging that uh, uh, Hyperallergic, where we are located here in Brooklyn, is on the land uh, of the traditional unceded territory of the Lenape. Um, and I wanna greet everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Tanya Tone is somebody that I, I believe everyone should know about. Her work is incredibly important, uh, particularly in a lot of contemporary Native American art, as she brings up a lot of the issues that people are just not talking about and should, should be thinking about. Um, she's the director of the Kiowa Tribal Museum and a beadwork and textile artist based in Oklahoma. Previously, she served as a curator of the Oklahoma History Center. And she's an alumna of the Harvard Extension School and the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, she's also had 25 years of experience in museums, contributing it to the arts, serving the US, Canada, and Europe. And her platform as a cultural arts leader is, a guy, is to guide organizational alignment in tribal diplomacy and diversity through engagement initiatives. So I'm very excited to host this. She's also one of the Emily H. Tremaine of uh, Curatorial Fellows um, uh, in Journalism, which is a special program we've set up to allow curators to speak to a wider audience and share and give insight into their work, um, as well as to create an email exhibition, which we'll also share with you um, uh, just shortly. So those of you who did not receive it can take a look at the type of work. And, and it was a very incredible uh, email exhibition, in my opinion, because uh, for the first time, the Kiowa tribe allowed uh, people outside of the community to see the images and, and the images don't circulate. Um, so this is a very rare opportunity, but also the fact that it was contextualized by a curator that works with the tribe um, as Tani does. So welcome Tani, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate your time and for including me on this project. A um, hey to all, uh, welcome. I'm Tawny Autone Harjo Growing Thunder. Some of you might know me by my big long name or by my short um, family name. Uh, my Kiowa name is Astompa'o, which translates to uh, the, like a first chosen to be paraded. Um, I, that was given to me by my tribal community among our elders at the Kiowa Gord clan. Um, it is a name that was passed from our family members from another family member who had passed away at that time, but it's in reference to the sister star, the constellation for the Dipper, um, because there's one female that leads um, uh, within our origin stories. And so I carry that name, not only for my family, but for my tribe. Uh, we are a Pachalino tribe uh, located in Southwest Oklahoma. Um, we are, we're a migratory tribe. So uh, talking about the migratory story of our people and then uh, displacement and removal to Oklahoma is uh, something that I, you know, not only our origin story, but our art and our, our culture speaks of as uh, the Koigu people. We speak the Koigu um, language um, known as the Kiowa. A lot of people try to say Kiowa, they try to pronounce all the words, but it's Kiowa, like Iowa. Um, and so, um, for my people, um, at least what we wanted to talk about were some of these hard topics that people kind of feel uncomfortable approaching at times in the art community. And that being um, one is the land acknowledgements, you know, um, that we've all grown accustomed to um, approaching a, <laughs> a land acknowledgement in the best way that you know how. Um, and for some communities, they appreciate that for some of us, we're still kind of perplexed to what, what that means, especially with um, displacement and removal, Indian removal to certain areas. Um, at this time, I'm on the ancestral homeland of the Wichita affiliated tribe, um, but I'm in an urban setting, uh, which means that we have many tribes, not just the 39 Oklahoma tribes, but more um, of that. And then likewise in New York, uh, we just, uh, for me, I don't just acknowledge the Lenape, but I always want to acknowledge the Haudenosaunee, uh, their contributions there to New York and Brooklyn, and also the Shinnecock, who are just down the road um, a Long Island. And uh, those of us in the Indian communities, when we say down the road, we don't, you know, we like to drive. So it'll be like two hours, eight hours, 10 hours. So being a, a New England uh, resident, 
people always found it crazy that we'd drive two hours to go to Target. So um, anyway, that, that's the start of where we are right now with the land acknowledgement. Absolutely. And one thing that we've talked about that I'd love for you to share a little bit is, you know, the uh, a little bit about notions of migration in indigenous communities and the fact that there are often a list of different tribes at the same time. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, a little bit about that in terms of how, you know, is there an actual protocol for, for non-native people in terms of using uh, the or identifying those groups? Is, is there um, a suggestion that people well, may not know about? Yeah, a lot of people don't know that, you know, um, there's a big difference between indigenous and uh, federally recognized. This country, the United States has a commitment um, which we haven't been so successful in <laughs> those trust relations of treaty relations. <laughs> but um, we, we can say that 574 tribes are federally recognized and that should be the priority of this country and of those uh, within these institutions in which we're working with because uh, as much as we want to be uh, inclusive to indigenous peoples, there is that commitment, not only by the federal government, but the commitment of the tribes and our sovereignty of what that means as individual governments and our, our affairs of when it comes to our culture and our rights. Um, but looking at uh, the migratory story of our people, at least for 39 tribes, there were, you know, they come from all across the country, from uh, the Northeast, from the North, from the South, from the West. And um, for our people, for the Kiowas, we, our uh, migratory path started in Canada we believe that we uh, emerged from the Vancouver area and uh, worked our way down through Banff, uh, came down and then settled in the uh, Devil's Tower area, uh, mm -hmm. Wyoming and the Dakotas and Montana. Um, many of our stories are there with Montana um, along the river, the Yellowstone River, the headway. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's where um, things changed for us. Um, I would say. And so we traveled back and forth. We had eventually um, with the adaption of the horse, and you'll see that in these murals, uh, the story that we're talking about. But um, with that, that allowed us to uh, move more, more uh, in which we needed to. And a lot of my research in which we're talking about is uh, mentions the diplomatic affairs in which we had pre-contact. And so having to get along with other tribes, having to uh, communicate in a way that was uh, beneficial, not only for our culture to survive, but for others. And yeah. um, looking into that history of where we are, I can just speak for us as Kiowa people, but you know there are many other stories. Um, just earlier I was on a call with uh, people at Meskwaki and uh, how resilient their people are and how they are in the state of Iowa. Um, and so that's what, you know, really I wanted to talk about with, with right. the subject of land. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's incredibly important. And um, your piece that the first article you published with Hyperallergic that I've just put in the chat for everyone to take a look at, um, what it means to curate for my Native American community. Um, you talk specifically about issues of Native American sovereignty. And I think that's a topic that is often ignored in the art community because of the way you describe the ethnicization of Native Americans in this country. As many of us know, uh, ethnic identities often become part of the sort of identity politics in this country. But you bring up the idea that, uh, or at least the fact that uh, Native American identity isn't racial. It's, it's actually much more complicated. Do you wanna talk a little bit about why the importance of sovereignty um, and, and what is their relationship to those that are working with art and historical materials from various tribes? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, first of all, we, you know, I never want to be, um, to forsake the idea of the help and the inclusion of trying to um, incorporate and represent us more. However, you know, the, the issue is in the definition. And for those of us that are tribal nations, these are individual governments that, you know, we, we have a government to government relationship with the federal government in Washington, DC. And that established that means that we will have funding available to run our tribes. We will be given the authority to have not only an executive 
a legislative and a judicial branch. So these are governments in which we have that, you, that we face the law. We provide the law. We put the, um, the guard down of who is protected and who isn't within our art, but also looking um, through the approach of the indigeneity because we are cultural, we are not ethnic. And these are individual cultural groups in which you, um, you embark on when you come to representing the federally recognized tribes. And, you know, and it's really hard for individuals to understand because, you know, we, we've got this idea now that, ah, the government, ah, you know, we, we don't want to deal with them, ah, it's too much trouble, you know, and, and looking into how um, we get overcome at times with the propaganda and which is out in the world when it comes to the news. And so that's why I'm so very thankful to be able to talk about this, not only through journalism, but through art writing and understanding where we are as cultural nations um, and sovereignty, because that sovereignty means that we act alone. We are able as uh, the executives of tribal nations to make laws and to enact them and then to use that diplomatic affair and move forward with the Congress uh, within Washington, DC. So indigenous groups of other countries, they might be able to do that with their crown, with their monarchy, but looking at it when it comes to us as tribal nations in this country, that's what we want everybody to understand that that is the sovereignty. You cannot make tribal nations a global affair when it comes to our sovereignty because it's different. The definition is different. It's, it's really, really interesting. Um, I just want to point out there is a Q&A section. If people have questions, we'll be happy to sort of answer them as we go along if it's relevant to what we're talking about. So you can just find that at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I would love to talk a little bit about what, what um, you're talking about, particularly journalism and how journalism sometimes gets the story out. Now, what are the protocols for tribes working with journalists or journalists that are writing about tribes? Is there sort of an understanding? Because I think there's a lot of lack of knowledge around this. Um, and I, I would love for you to sort of help us understand that. Mm -hmm. Well, you and I talk about that and, you know, my, my family, I come from a family of journalists and, um, and I have to tell everybody, I, I didn't go to Columbia, I went to Harvard and all my folks went to Columbia Journalist School and so I got a lot of flack for going to, going to Cambridge, but anyway, all that aside, I digress, but um, uh, that being said, you know, we're always talking and we have our own signal and our own slack that we're talking about. Uh, when we see these news releases or when we see um, art news hit the line that, you know, we're, um, we're concerned because just as we establish protocol when it comes to working with museums and working with native art, I think we're at that time now where we get to establish the protocol to work with journalism because we have issue of pseudo-Indianism. We have the issues of um, uh, people claiming to be something they're not. But when it comes down to that research, just as we are expected to have academic excellence as scholars, we expect that excellence when it comes to the reporting. And a lot of times that's not happening or the press release and then the method of which how journalists are supposed to report, they add to the story and they might find something um, dated or somebody made a claim somewhere that they might imply they're indigenous, but without researching that. And so we're, we're asking that further now um, at the Native American Journalism Association, where I'm a member as well, um, that we need to investigate more. And uh, you just can't put somebody's uh, idea of a tribal nation in parentheses behind their name because right. does that tribal nation claim them? Are they enrolled? Are they citizens? Are they descendants? And we have the you know, big problem with the word descendancy because anybody could be descendant. I'm descendant of uh, a white captive from the United Kingdom from Wales, but I don't claim, you know, how far back we're gonna take this? <laughs> descendancy is kind of the question, but when, you know, we're looking at the protocol and how that is and what is that? That means, if you're, you know, um, fact checking, move forward, go forward to the tribal enrollment offices and call. Um, tribal enrollment offices have no problem with verifying details. And that again is that governmental role that we have, that we, we have that authority to say who is and who is not. And you have to question your writing. You have to question 
your research, if that person is not known to that tribal nation, it makes it very um, difficult. It makes it hard to believe or even to trust art writing if people aren't doing that investigative work or that research. Okay, that makes sense. So now how are ways that native sovereignty is being undermined when they are, when uh, different tribes are not included in the conversation or their narratives are not incorporated? Mm -hmm. um, are there any examples or is there, is there um, any just general thoughts you might have about that? Well, we tend to call it consultation. Uh, nothing without us about it, you know, about us. Nothing, yeah, nothing about us without us. Sorry, I got it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, my Hayoka is coming out, but um, I, I would say that, um, you know, it, it starts with that communicative practice. And a lot of times when you're going to look at the more traditional tribes like the Kiowa or the Apache um, or Cheyenne or Arapaho, um, uh, Mandan, uh, Hidatsa, um, Arikara, you, you know, you, you're going to have these more traditional tribes that uh, keep their knowledge. And so when we're talking about museums, galleries, artists, writers, scholars, uh, academics, sometimes you just can't send a cold email. That's seen as disrespect in some of our communities. Um, you can't just call and expect us five days later to respond uh, for a translation, or you, can't, uh, you just can't reach out how you would in the tech world because that goes against our whole idea and our practice. If you're genuine and you want to know about us, you want to learn about us, there's this process, this gift giving and that knowledge in which you have to understand. In the old days, in the old ways or traditional way in which we have, that's a form of tobacco. That's a form of bringing seeds or a plant or bringing fabric or groceries. And you have to give that to these individuals if you want that knowledge from them. And I know that uh, as the former uh, curator and uh, tribal liaison for the state of Oklahoma, that I learned that I knew that going in, but I kind of thought, ah, you know, folks know who I am. I can just email and find out what it is. And I got a talking to from one of my close friends at uh, the uh, Fort Sill Apache. And they said, you know, that's not how you do that. We know you don't, we know you know not to do that. And, um, I thought, yeah, you know, I, I need to like share this with my colleagues because they wonder why certain nations like the Kickapoo or the Tonkwa, um, these tribes don't engage with their programs. And that's a big question that some of, you know, museum curators, museum professionals, directors, education groups, you've got to look at. If you have a gap in your collection or you have a gap in your curriculum, look at the way and how you're corresponding to them because that might be your whole issue. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So what, uh, um, is there a protocol that is published anywhere or something that people can research um, about that process? Um, yeah, I, I'm one main uh, source that I like to tend to uh, refer people to is the First American Art Magazine. Uh, sure. The editor, um, America Meredith, uh, she's a really close friend, community member, a lot of us know her. Um, if she doesn't know, she'll know somebody that knows. Or likewise, for me, if, if I don't know, I'll find somebody. But, um, you know, really, we ask individuals to reach out to the tribes. The tribes really want to be involved. And a lot of times it comes with hurt feelings because projects, huge projects will take off. And um, no mention of the tribe. You know, there'll be pages of articles written about our ceremonial groups. Uh, about our, our elders that have passed, but no mention of us, or as if we don't even exist as grandchildren or great-grandchildren of, of these individuals. And so looking at that is, is something that I've often thought about, you know, are we doing this at the American Alliance of Museums? Are we accurately teaching museum professionals and galleries and the arts community to work with us or are we just working with the wrong individuals? And that's always a big question. And I always wonder, am I that right individual? Am I, <laughs> how much, you know, how much do I need to invest more beyond my uh, busy schedule to educate people just out of the free will? And right. um, that is an obligation within our tribal community. So that's why I'm here today uh, with my, my people, my folks, my, my tribe, 
and my leaders is because they are expecting me to move forward and educate as a way that they expect of me. Um, they might not be able to communicate that. Um, sometimes it might come from a harsh place, but in a good way. You know, we, we like to say that in our church. We like to say that in our belief. In a good way, I'm coming to you to help you. You mm -hmm. might feel like we're getting after you. You might feel like we're correcting you. But in a good way, we're trying to teach you to do better next time. And that's really what, what that form of um, collaboration, that consultation is there for. Now there's the overarching part of, um, of forced consultation <laughs> of when it comes to NAGPRA, Indian Arts and Crafts Act, um, when it comes to- So for uh, the people who may not know, that's the, that's the um, act that uh, deals with the authentication of work and who can actually make work as well as the return and different protocols around that, correct? Yes, and the Graves Protection Act. That's right. Um, objects of cultural patrimony. So we do have that um, that is based on consultation and where we are often really busy with that. But most interestingly um, to speak, you know, I'm really encouraged um, as the pandemic moves on, because we're having these conversations of dire need to say, consult with us, work with us. You just can't go find a token individual and say, will you work with us? You know, is it a prize curator? Is it a prized artist? That might be fine, but you still got to engage with that tribe because that individual might not be who you need to work with with that tribe. And we, you know, with them in my own tribe, we've seen banishment. We've seen um, curators who try to come, they, they do it their way and then they get banished from the tribe. Nobody will talk to them again. And it comes with hard feelings or, or artists. Um, but they, they don't tend to do that too much with the artists, but it, it's with these scholars that, that come doing kind of what they want to do but you know there are people that are ethical and that and that's kind of how I got in uh, involved in curation and museums is because there were these individuals Barbara Hale at uh, Half and Refer Museum she's the emeriti there uh, the curator for Brown University's museum um, she worked very closely with our community and our family um, Candace Green at the Smithsonian uh, she with the ledger art and so these are the individuals that really taught me as a child I'm not trying to date or age anybody but you know taking it back I remember as a child these were protocols in which I saw from my elders from my grandfather and at, you know at the time I thought it was dying because I'd have to get up and go to another museum I thought I'd have to um, you know it was just a as a kid you think oh god I gotta go do this another boardroom another another uh, big table I'd have to sit under and lay under and uh, with Suzanne Sean Harjo we always talk about the good old days even though I'm middle-aged now I told her I, said, I remember being a little kid in the old days when you guys could smoke cigarettes at those board tables and I'd come out from under the table from drawing with my pencils and pen it'd just be all smoky because people were smoking cigarettes in there and um, having big conversations on these exhibitions that would never, you know, they, they always had bigger intentions than what they were. But, um, you know, those were the kind of ethical practices in which I saw. And so I always like to think I've had a seat at the table um, and, and now it's my turn to turn around and open the door and the gate for, for others. And so that's why I'm glad I'm here with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. There's a question that was kind of asked privately because I think it was maybe a little awkward for the person to ask, but mm -hmm. I just want to sort of bring it up because they said that they had a curated an exhibition or of Indigenous Appalachia and invited 20 artists and only heard back from five of them. And they're wondering, is it because they went straight to the artist and not the tribal nation? Is that the example of like what you're talking about? It can be at times. Yeah, oh. yeah definitely. Okay. You, you have to understand too that um, no matter where the tribal community is, I'm one of those individuals that has family still without uh, electricity, running water, internet. Um, and so, you know, 
the, those cold calls are, are really difficult understanding where we are. And that's in Oklahoma. People, some, people right. think it's, sometimes they think it's just New Mexico, Arizona, but, um, and, and it happens in other parts of the country as well. And a lot of times too, the artist just decide, I don't want to do it. Um, yeah. I, I'm a child of an artist and she picks and chooses what she wants to do. <laughs> that's right. It, it might not be a good fit or the context for what they want to do. Mm -hmm. and that, mm -hmm. that's that's absolutely they're artists at the end of the day mm -hmm. um now one of the unique things about your position is you're the actual curator at the at a at an at an actual native american tribe and there's very few positions like that is mm -hmm. that correct there is um there's a, a association called um what is it oh i'd have to look it up atom somebody help me with the acronym uh, but ATOM is an organization that focuses on tribal archives, libraries, and museums. Association, I think, is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, looking at that, you know, there, there are uh, a lot it's of... Associate, I just want to... Somebody uh, chimed in. Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Okay. I was close. <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of order. Um, but yeah, yeah, they're, we're really fortunate to have this organization because they came together understanding the need of tribal museums. And uh, since their inception, uh, there have been more cultural centers and tribal archives and libraries, museums that have opened. Um, at the time uh, of when ATOM started, uh, the Kiowa Tribal Museum had already been um, in existence for maybe 30 years. Um, we decided as a tribal nation that we needed a museum. Um, and the, the backstory on that is my grandfather was the tribal administrator at the time when they started having these um, conversations, a need to preserve a culture. So this is in the 1970s. <clears throat> and um, then he became the tribal chairman. And um, I was born around that time. And there was this opening area within our tribal complex which is like in a horseshoe shape and it was a four-year area. And people would just go out there to smoke and do whatever, you know, and it was just this idea, we're gonna enclose this space, make a museum, we're gonna hear the stories of these elders because they're, they're it came to a point where they were having to insist that we need to um, uh, create a museum at that time and preserve our culture. So, you know, that story is like there with a lot of these other tribes, uh, like I shared with the Meskwaki, their cultural center is one that started out from small and it, it, it's evolved. But then you even have the huge um, Mash and Tuck at Pequot Museum and Research Center, which is right. in Connecticut, yeah. or you have uh, the Muckleshoot or the, um, I, I think it's the uh, Coeur d'Alene. You know, the, there's beautiful museums that are out there. And uh, we do have our own curators, we do have our own directors, but what's unique about my role at the Kiowa tribe is um, I was working at the state, I had come from New England and um, it was like payroll shock. Uh, I'm not bagging on Oklahoma, but dang, it was hard. <laughs> it, was, it was difficult. I mean, I became an Instacart shopper and a, garage seller, eBayer, I, I became all of that having to just make ends meet. And um, my tribal community would all, always say, well, you know, we need help. How are you going to help us? How, you know, can you do this? And I said, well, you know, I really need to be supported financially because it's very difficult moving from New England pay wages to um, low-income communities. And I've always grown up in a low-income community, impoverished communities. And so, just because I grew up that way doesn't mean I need to stay that way. And I always say that when it comes to our budgets and our funding, our grants, uh, that we have unique perspectives, we have unique projects, and that's why I thought it was so important to come to our tribe. And even though they knew that maybe I could only contribute a little bit of time to them, it was worth it for them instead of not having me. And so um, not that I'm like, a superstar or you know being egotistical about it but what it was is that my understanding of how museums function was 
they needed help to understand how to maneuver the process to even just keep the doors open, even just to be able to how to apply for a grant, how to um, work with a board, how to work with the community, and ultimately um, bridge that over to creating the audiences. And um, throughout my um, educational background, my career, I've always been good at math. I've always been good at numbers. I've been very frugal when it comes to budgets. And so when I serve different organizations, institutions, that's been my forte. I have no problem with fundraising. I didn't know that that was a secret gift, but- um, it is. It's a rare <laughs> secret gift for many people. <laughs> I, I, I like to deal with numbers and, you know, it, and I wrote about that in the article that some people fear numbers so much that, you know, there's this, mistreatment in education where people think I'm bad at math or I hate math, but it's just another artistic form. And I know that as an artist, I know that as somebody who has that inherent knowledge or that, that um, intangible knowledge of numbers that the algorithms will always work out if we work with them. <laughs> and right. so um, that talent in which I had was what the, the tribe really wanted to uh, work with. And so um, we had a board. Um, my mom was on that board at the time. Some other friends and relatives were on there. But there was just... Um, uh, I don't want to say issue, but there was a little bit of problems because they just could never get to where they needed to be when it came to grants and fundraising. And so this idea of sovereignty when it comes to the Kiowa tribe, our tribal chairman is very much adamant that, um, that we, we do things as traditional as possible. And he said, you know, I hear all this stuff about decolonization. I don't like that word. And I don't tend to use it that much. I never claimed to decolonize, but um, I, I listened to him and I heard with his ideas of what he wanted to do. And he said, we've got our uh, traditional leaders. We have three ceremonial groups with the Kiowas. It's the Kiowa Gord clan, the Ohama and the Tonkongia, which is our uh, Black Lagan society. And those are our men's societies, but those men's societies also have to do with um, points of family and honor and are, are still warrior traits. And we're a young tribe, we're a young um, uh, format of, of government um, within the past a hundred some years. And so we needed to preserve that. And so we, even though we have a board of directors, those board of directors are those tribal leaders from those three different societies. And um, I don't know if it's good or bad, but a lot of them are my relatives and my uncles. And so that whole thing in nonprofits of you can't have a conflict of interest, we've just totally like messed that thing up. We, we, just, we <laughs> did that with the sand of saying, you know, eh, conflict of interest, we're just going to push every barrier. But um, these are my uncles. And so a lot of, at the end of the day, a lot of what I have to do is listen to them. I have to be that good grandchild. I have to be that good relative to listen to them. But I also have a strong cultural background, a connection. I'm a silent speaker of the language. I grew up with the language in my household, two tribal languages, um, my dad's and my grandfather's from two different tribes. And that's where I learned with um, that this was something that I was going to have to hear their translations and their words and use that idea of nonprofit and museums and institutions to translate it back to them of what they need and help them understand what they need. So that's kind of what, um, what I, I say is very different for us at the Kiowa Tribal Museum. I don't know if other tribes are like that um, um, out there, if they've taken that approach, but what we've done with that is we've created our own um, um, in, not, we don't call it institutional, we call it internal review board. And so again, we go back to that consultation with these scholars. If you wanna write about Kiowa art, you come to us. We have our own board of scholars that are Kiowa who are credentialed, they're PhDs. They have years of research. They have years of uh, intangible and indigenous knowledge in which can be transferred 
And you, you don't have to be native to come to that review board and ask us, but it will be gone through and we will check and fact check and help you. Um, and you know, we made it as a service with our educational program, our higher education program, and made it a priority because again, these elders were getting tired of seeing exhibitions happen, written about them, their ceremonial groups, nobody came to them, offered them anything, they just wrote about it, or they would pull up in their rent car, come to Gord clan, attend, witness it, go back, write about it, and then the leaders would not even know anything about it till it publishes. And so um, it was an insistence that uh, the legislators and the executives said, we're going to do this. Um, and we're going to do it our way. And, and that's, I, yeah, I guess the rest is, yeah. <laughs> the rest yeah, yeah is absolutely. Um, somebody has a question here that I've never actually really thought about, but they, I guess they're, they must be a gallery owner. And they said, when artists contact you to have their work in our gallery, is there a protocol for that? Um, is that something should, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing based on what you're saying, you should call the tribe to find out if that person is saying who they are, perhaps? Is, is there any other kind of uh, protocol you would suggest to gallerists? I would, um, yeah, definitely. You want to verify their tribal enrollment background. You want to verify their identity of who, who they are. Um, also, too, you might, I, I, it's going to be hard to say, I'm going to say it. I try, I try not to go off the rail too bad, but um, yeah, you might see if that person's an upstanding person in a community because sometimes they've been banished. We have that authority as tribal nations uh, with our judicial um, branches that you can remove people from your community. And you know, if they're up to no good or if they've done something wrong in their professional career, um, you might ask and there are galleries getting in trouble with that right now that um they they sign on they they want to do what the other galleries doing they want to do what the other museums doing they see a big superstar and they're not researching and then afterwards it's a lot of a lot of red tape and uh bureaucracy that you got to go through um but nonetheless i'd like to say that that's job security for some of us because it's we're we're in problem resolution so right. Right. Museums will always get in trouble, so here we are. <laughs> well, I mean, this is a, this is also part of respecting sovereignty and doing the work, as you say. Um, you know, there's uh, somebody also asked. I just want to sort of ask you: Is how is membership in a tribe determined for people who may not know? Is there is they how does that um, work? Because I, I there seems to be a number of questions of people asking questions around that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's based on the tribe themselves. The tribe decides who is their member and who is not. Some are based on blood quantum. Some are based on descendancy. Uh, the Dawes role is a, a major one that we have to look at. Um, Indian allotment land. So it, it is really based on how the tribe determines that. So if you're working with the citizen band Potawatomi, they're going to be different than the Potawatomi of Kansas. Um, and, um, or if you're working with the Cherokee Nation, they're gonna be different than Eastern Band Cherokee. But, um, you know, and we do have, unfortunately, we've got these groups that they think they can make a website and a little pay button and, you know, uh, call themselves a tribe. And uh, anyway, that's just the whole. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it's a complicated issue, but that's why we're talking to a professional. Um, you it, know, it is. That, yeah, exactly and, what, and every what, tribe will determine who is their um, individual. Some, uh, most of us Indian people will uh, enroll our children at mm -hmm. um, birth, and we make that decision as parents. Um, sometimes people will wait till they're 18, but they're, um, and your parents will still have to help you. There is a case by case um, um, uh, practice. Uh, tribes can appoint somebody to be an artisan, but it has to go through a tribal resolution. It has to go through public notice. So you just can't trust somebody's idea or um, a statement to say, oh, I'm a tribal artisan for this group. I you see. can't just have any letter. That letter is going to have to come from that tribe from their judicial, their executive branch that determines them to be, um, you know, just like a bill. 
you, right. you, Absolutely. Uh, it has to go through a, a certain protocol. So, I mean, we're, we have 20 minutes left, but I want you to, just before we start, I know it's like, this is, uh, I knew this would go really fast because there's so much to cover and it's great talking to you. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about the murals themselves and yeah. sort of understanding, first of all, the decision to share them with the public um, mm -hmm. in this format, as well as just generally how they came into being and what role do these murals play in the community itself, because these are, they seem to be living testaments to commu communal knowledge and different sort of storytelling um, and, and history. If you can explain that a little bit, and I posted a link in the chat for those who are interested to see the email if they hadn't received it. Um, and I'll just post it again to make it a little more convenient for people. So if you can answer that, I'd appreciate it. Okay, yeah, well, going back to, um the inception of the Kiowa Tribal Museum, the, there was this group of elders. Uh, Louis Toibo at the time was um, very instrumental in gathering these elders in the community. And he, um, he uh, said, we need the museum, we need to preserve our language, we need to preserve our culture. And they, this was at the time, time when we had um, uh, fluent speakers in an old language. Now what we speak today is a little bit of a form of a dialect change and um, uh, in English influence, but also a tonal influence. And so uh, my grandfather was a, a first language speaker and um, both he and my grandmother and other relatives in our community. And, um, you know, we always hear this boarding school story that, you know, they were forbidden to talk to this, you know, certain language or whatever. And what my grandpa always told me was, you know, they just didn't, they underestimated us as Indian people that we weren't smart enough to learn a second language or to carry a second language. It's like you had to push one language out to learn another. Um, and so that was always uh, the insistence of our elders in the community was that we had so much um, intelligence that we, we need to figure this out for ourselves in our own way. And so these murals came to be with that um, these elders telling stories, recordings. We have, uh, sometimes you can see it on YouTube, the old video um, reels that had um, them talking. And it came to them that they said, we need to leave some kind of document for our people to come, our generations to come off of that. And so they knew that we had these three artists. They knew that they needed to be um, encouraged because of their creativity. And this is about the time when we had lost Tommy Cannon, TC Cannon, um, to most of you in the community, Tommy Cannon. I don't know if my Auntie Joyce is on, but um, um, it was at this time. So, you know, we're, our young folks are, are creative. They're going to Institute of American Indian Arts and uh, let's do something. And so they brought these young men in to, to paint with this idea that you need to talk about us, but we don't know how to say it. There's not a word in our language for this. So we're gonna speak the Kiowa language, you're gonna hear us, and then you're going to implement what we're talking about into these murals. And these artists, it's Parker Boyd or Jr., Merrick Creeping Bear and Sherman Chattelson. And that whole um, idea was that you need to leave these creation stories behind so they'll be able to see it. And our, our language is, we might not connect with each other eye to eye when we learn. We learn by listening, we learn by seeing and feeling. And that's really what the idea was with this project, this painting project was because they're giving a visual experience of what you're hearing at home. And you start by hearing this from birth. You hear it from within the womb who you are, the songs, um, the language, and that's, that's your identity. That's what you're gonna move with in your life. And so Parker starts out at the top of this. I don't know if those can look at the top of the picture, but that's our creation story of uh, what we believe we came, we emerged. Um, the, the English translation is that we emerged from um, the earth as ants um, through this creation story. And we have a trickster, we have the animals, um, without going too far into the storytelling. But that translation just doesn't mean that we saw ourselves as ants. We saw ourselves as being insignificant as individuals, that we had to be this person, this individual that needed to give 
and to work and to work with each other. And so that's what that translation means of, um, of that image. And you'll see that because that trickster is always there. And we're only supposed to talk about this person in the wintertime. So it's a good thing that we're, we're uh, talking about it now because our belief is you don't talk about it outside of winter. Right. And um, that's the time to learn. And uh, so those of you that are writing and in school, right now is your time to learn, um, learn from us. And so um, that's another that part of the protocol. <laughs> Yeah, I was about to ask. So in that case, then, if you are, let's say, a scholar or a curator working on this, would you take that into account when you approach a tribe? You would. Yeah, there's things that we talk about certain seasons, certain times. Um, like if you're going to do an earring exhibit, we only do that at a certain time of period. Um, also, too, like Southwest tribes, I know working with some items like we won't work with them at night because we respect that rest. We respect that daylight. Um, you respect the story and, and you'll see that in these murals too. Um, the half boy, um, which is the belief of the sky home and the earth home, which is our creator. Um, and you'll see that in our artwork and our clothes, um, our cultural items, you'll see the red and blue and um, in relation to our relatives, uh, we have in our own belief that we're related to the Sami um, right. um, of Norway because the language is so similar the oh. belief, the stories. Um, and I so, didn't know that. I didn't know that connection. That's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. And we, you know, and we, we have this, I, we have this problem with people thinking we stayed in one place <laughs> right. as if we can get around. And then we go back to that migratory look of who we are, where we are, displacement um, uh, of what, what it is. But um, at least for, for Parker and his work, he's the most significant to me out of this group because um, these are my uncles, even though we might not be closely blood related, we're related. And I was talking to my mom this morning. Um, she's uh, Sharon Atonhardo, she's an artist, she's a ledger artist, and she has her own um, um, uh, placement on her within our community as a document keeper, um, as a ledger artist. And our tribe, we're not so much that this is a man's form or this is a woman's form. It's a form of who can do it and do the job. And that's what, it, you know, we're looking at with it. But I was talking with her today and I said, you know, I still can smell Parker's um, cologne. You can smell the cigarettes and hear them laugh. I mean, they were rugged when they laughed and teased and joked. And I still hear that. I can still remember his cowboy boots coming in to the complex. And um, Sherman was real quiet and, or at least quiet for me. Um, but when he got around his his relatives, they, you know, I knew to excuse myself because that wasn't a place for children's ears or <laughs> they, they had a good time with themselves. And so that's why these murals mean so much to me. I wanted to share them. But with the tribe, the tribal chairman <clears throat> said, you know, we've got this commitment. We've got these journals. We've got these articles that were written about um, these pieces. And it was always intended for them to be a fundraiser for the museum to make a calendar, make a book, do a traveling exhibition. And as time went on, we lost the individuals one by one. And um, somewhere along the way, they became protected. They just kept, you know, they were closed to, the com to anybody else outside of the community. And um, there wasn't even photographs of them. You couldn't even take a selfie. Was that a conscious, that was a conscious decision on the part of the tribe? That was, I think, a decision at the time because they didn't know what to do. I don't know if it was conscious. It was because do we protect them? Do we not? Um, you know, and I saw other museums saying no flash photography. And so that kind of got, it, there was just a misunderstanding of what to do with them. And at this time, um, I, I want to say about 2017, we adopted a new constitution with our tribal government and that established the le legislators and Angela Chattelson uh, McCarthy was a district one, we have different districts, voting districts. And she came to me and she said, you know, I really want to honor um, my dad's um, wishes to have this exhibition travel. Let, let's look into it. Is there something you can do? And I hadn't been hired yet by the tribe. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll keep thinking about it, writing about it, what, what can I do? And then um, 2019, we were gonna have a traveling exhibition for 2020. And then of course, 2020 happened. So um, 
And unfortunately we lost Angela and not to say too much um, about that, but the loss was sent me thinking in, and the great loss we had in our tribal community of our leaders and our um, cultural bearers and individuals who pass knowledge along that I needed to get this out into the world as they intended, which they expected me to do. It wasn't, I needed to do for myself. I needed to do for my people. And um, with the support of our tribal leaders of our, um, our bundle keepers mainly um, that we, we decided as a group, I didn't decide, I should say, they decided for me <laughs> that I would find a stream to share this. And so we're looking at this time for venues again to um, uh, host this exhibition. But right now, the best thing, thing that we thought we'd, we'd do was share it with you. Um, and we're very, we're very honored. You. We're very honored you shared these and we were able to share those with, yeah. with uh, over 150,000 email addresses. A lot oh, of people. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. it's wonderful. Um, yeah. You know, I think I, I also wanted to sort of ask, uh, you know, uh, there were a number of questions here. So I, cause I know we're getting to time and this is such a fascinating topic. First of all, I wanted to ask, what are the ambitions? And I hope there are curators watching this that may want to approach or their, maybe their institution wants to show these or, or approach you. How would be a way for them to approach you? How, how would be uh, an appropriate protocol for something like that? Well, for myself, um, being a director, I am a, a program, a federal program. So I, am open to the public, <laughs> to the Kiowa tribe. And so there, there are ways to find us, um, no matter if you're writing an article or if you're just unsure uh, mm -hmm. of what to do, or if you wanna work with Kiowa individuals, we tend to do that, um, reach out to them. And uh, a lot of times too, our, our tribal artists were out, are out there. They'll be like, man, I got a Facebook message or I got a DM. Why didn't they go through the tribe? You know, why, you know, they'll come back to us and say, you know, or they'll come back and ask, should I do this? I wanna make sure the, the folks at home will be okay with it. And, um, but at least for me, I'm on Instagram. I'm uh, curating indigeneity on Instagram. You can follow me. I've got an open profile. You can stalk me if you don't wanna. <laughs> don't, don't stalk her. <laughs> <laughs> but reach out and share Please. appreciation. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And my journalist cousins forced me to get a Twitter. So I have a Twitter. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing with it. Um, but yeah, you can look us up, Kiowa Tribal Museum. Uh, you can just go to kiowatribe.org. Um, we're working on our museum. Uh, website, but that's the unfortunate thing to ha not have an internet in certain communities that were yeah. slow, slow to come to the table when it comes to those things. Absolutely. So now I want to try to get to through as many questions as, as we can. One of them is uh, the question is asking now, do Native American artists need to receive approval from their tribe to participate in program outside of the tribal community? Um, is that is that something that has to be done for artists? I don't say all of them, but it would be a good practice. You just don't want to be um, out in the world saying, you know, this and that, and then your folks at home be like, he don't know what he's talking about. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but he never comes home. Why is he talking? Why is he claiming us now? You know, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, now, also, Piers, then a couple of questions here about uh, the talking about the dislike of the term decolonizing. Do you want to talk a little bit about that or if there is uh, something you'd like to add? Because I think a lot of people are wondering um, why yeah. that is. Well, I just personally don't think, I mean, for myself, it's not possible for me to decolonize. Um, I got four walls, electricity, um, a map book, but, and I love it all. Thank you. Um, but I, I am traditional. I, I, I'm not the most traditional of my folks, but... Um, I, I still run my camp. I still have uh, traditional practices I have to go through. You know, even my hair, the way that I talk and the way that I look is still um, very traditional in, in some form. But I, at least for myself, my museum and the work that I can do, um, how I understand it. And for me, it's just a buzzword is to get you excited, to think that you, you know, you're making an effort to include us mm -hmm. if you, you know, but we're also not asking you to dump drawers and give everything back to, to us um, as Kai was. Mainly, we just want access to our items and we want to know what you have, but we're not asking for it back. 
Um, that's our own belief system. Um, you don't disturb. Um, so anyway. Yep, absolutely. So now other, um, someone's asking if there's any guidance of working with non-federally recognized tribe and if there is a different process for that. Mm, I don't know if I could say anything. Yeah, it, it's really tricky and don't, don't go down that path if you don't know it's a real state recognized tribe. Um, it's gonna be messy in the New England area. It's gonna be messy in um, Texas. Um, yeah, just, <laughs> you wanna save yourself a headache. <laughs> so um, someone's asking about, um, as a high school art teacher, um, mm -hmm. for my advanced art class, I wanna include a unit on Native American art. So I think this person is asking, uh, they want to make sure that people understand Native American art and culture is present and vibrant and not just traditional craft. So they're just asking some artists perhaps that, uh, or maybe resources, perhaps the, um, that they can, they can consult in order to discover those. And I'm wondering if there's any that you'd like to share. Yeah, well, definitely. First American Art Magazine is always the first step. Um, with that, also tribal museums, if, you know, depending where you're located, look at the federal registrar to see what tribes are in your area. Um, and a lot of times we have our own curriculum. So at least for us, Mashantucket, I know Muskwaki, myself, Malak Band, Minnesota, we all have our own K through 12 based curriculum that we are more than well, I mean, I, I'm more than happy to share it with any teacher. Um, you can look at uh, the state of Oklahoma, Oklahoma History Center, we have curriculum bases there. And then also the Title VII Johnson O'Malley programs, um, which are federally funded programs for Native American students in the public school districts, will also have curriculum there as well, that you can lean on those programs without having to reinvent the wheel and write, write your own. So I'm also going to read this question. It's a, it's a few sentences, so just bear with me. On representing a multiplicity of sovereignties, there have been major accomplishments by Native women within the world of non-Native museums. Most recently, many of us celebrated the announcement of Cynthia Chavez Lama as being named the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. She's the first Native woman to run one of the Smithsonian's institutions. A few months ago, the first America's Museum opened in Oklahoma City under the curatorial leadership of Heather Atone. And then there is the appo uh, appointment of Pat Patricia Joaquin Norby at the Met as a curator. And there are other also others. There's also the Kathy Ash Milby at the Portland Art Museum. Um, also some significant independent curators, including Miranda Bell Bellard Lewis and Na Nancy Mitlow. Um, who is currently working on a book on her on her intervention? She's been at, been at the Venice Biennale since 1999. Cur curating is representational. As a curator, how do you negotiate representing other Native nations without usurping their sovereignty? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you know, um, we'll we'll run down the the names because you know, as Indian people, we want our names said right, <laughs> especially me. You know, being Please, Miranda Bellarde Lewis. Um, Nancy Marie Mythlow, um, Kathleen Ash Milby, Heather Odtone, and I forgot the first one. What was the first one? The first one was uh, Cynthia Chavez Lama. Oh, Cynthia Chavez Lamar. Yeah. Lama. Um, yeah, and you know, congratulations to Cynthia. It's a, a big feat for a lot of Indian women out in the world. Um, right now, um, I guess looking at the representation, the curatorial, that, you know, we, we've got to look at that of, uh, again, prioritizing our federally recognized tribes. And so that means a lot for these tribes to have Cynthia at that seat. And it also means a lot to have Kathleen at Portland and to have Nancy at UCLA. Um, you know, but when we have individuals that are representing indigenous groups and maybe descendants, that might be a little bit of issue, especially for us tribal nations, because again, they might not know, or sometimes they just plain don't know how to engage with us. Boston MFA recently appointed uh, an indigenous person, but not of um, federal recognition. And how is that going to translate when it comes to actually working with the art, actually knowing the art? Because we have this trend, and I'm not saying it's any of these curators, but we have a trend in national museums and institutions 
to go to Instagram, who has a website, who has, you know, and, and if you look at a lot of my paperwork and my um, research, it's about finding the absolute creativity and the exceptional art within the communities. So it's not going to be the ambiguous art of trying not to relate to a tribal nation. It's going to be the absolute culture of that tribal nation and that celebration of their knowledge. And so we're looking at bandolier bags. We're looking at artists who are going to have um, that real intent cultural knowledge from start to finish of that, that body of work instead of the monetization of that work. And so that's the real difference in which we have to see in these cultural institutions, if they're buying the, the it crowd or if they're buying the actual creativity. Got it. So- I'm um, hurt for some folks, but sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's a, a great. And I, and I appreciate everything you're, you're sharing with us. Um, we, are, we have hit the uh, 8, 8 uh, p.m. mark. Uh, we were saying this conversation is one hour. So I'm wondering if there are any final thoughts you might have. I mean, I don't think we can really cover all these questions because they're really uh, extensive. And it seems like people, you've really um, been helping people understanding and bringing out some of the questions. I'm wondering if there's anything that you'd like to sort of finish with and, uh, and uh, perhaps share about this whole process and as your work as a curator, because at the focus of this uh, fellowship is we really want to highlight curators and their different practices and how those sort of function. Um, so the screen is yours. Oh, awesome. All right. Well, don't hang up yet, guys. Uh, get your pen. I'm going to give you a list of names of curators to look at. My favorite list. All right. Um, this is like Oprah's top 10. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you. So I, I really like to look at the work of um, Anya Montiel. I like to look at the work of Deborah Yippa Papin at uh, Field Museum. I love Hunter Old Elk, um, her work and what she's doing in Wyoming. At the, I, it's called Great Plains. Um, somebody help me with that name of that museum. <laughs> um, Von, Veronica Pipestem, um, really doing great work um, as museum professionals. And um, again, you know, we, we've got individuals that are working in other places of curation who are doing a lot of work. So, you know, I always want to challenge that idea of these first isms in which we're saying we're experiencing. You know honoring the life of Lloyd Oxidine, who was actually the first curator to work with the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, he is Lumbee, or he was Lumbee, um, helped with the career of my mom and many others. Uh, Rene de Hardencourt, who was at the MoMA um, and his history and his connection back to the Kiowa tribe. Um, again, looking at the actual history and doing your research. So, you know, individuals, do that research because you can't make a claim that says somebody's the first if there was already something that happened in 1933. Um, you know, looking at that. But I also want to give a shout out to Latanya. I love Latanya's work. Um, also uh, at Brooklyn, we've got Kim, Kim Martin and Stephanie Sparling Williams, who just been hired. I'm really excited to see what work's going to happen there um, uh, to come. Uh, and Catherine Footer that, you know, shout out over there. I love them, the pieces there. And then um, even my friends from the cohort. Oh, and I'm really excited about the Whitney Biennial. So Adrian Edwards, I love, I love her so much. Um, she's always like, girl, they don't even know what to do with us sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, really, I, I'm excited for what is to come. You know, we are here not to just make it hard on you. We want to make it easy. So, you know, really reach out, uh, follow Curating Indigeneity. I just opened my podcast back up. So don't, don't expect too much. It was an early podcast before everybody else had one, but um, it, it, it's back to recording again. So yeah. I want to yeah. A number of people are asking about the names you mentioned. I'm wondering maybe they can follow you on Instagram if you can share some of the names, maybe in stories or something yeah. for those people who may may have not uh, heard the, heard those names. I did post a link to your Instagram in the chat for those mm -hmm. who want to take a look, as well as your Twitter um, account. But as you mentioned, your Instagram is certainly Twitter. much more 
by, uh, much more active. So I think that's great. And uh, I also want to acknowledge some of the people who are attending. I also, I saw America uh, Meredith, who you mentioned earlier. And I just want to say that many of us who, you know, we're trying to learn more about uh, Native American art. Um, she's been an incredible uh, person to uh, to follow and, and follow her work. But I just sort of want to shout out a fellow journalist and writer and educator. And uh, so I think that's so important. And there's also a lot of other great people on this chat. Yeah, well, yeah. Tanya, I just want to thank you for your, for your generosity and thank you for sh helping to share the mural for people, uh, the murals, and, and hopefully it will create the start of a conversation. People re will reach out to you and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, for consultations and, and also maybe they can hire you to curate some. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. yeah, host this show. And then, like I said, because we are uh, feds, we're federal offices, um, we are more than uh, excited to work with you if you have classrooms um, to teach about this. There's not enough that we can do um, at this point to offer our services, uh, at least at the Kiowa Tribe um, for educational, like I said, curriculum, if you need to talk, whatever, that's what we're there for. And yep. people don't often utilize that resource. So definitely reach out. Fantastic. And next week at the same time on Tuesday at 7 p.m. New York time, we'll be having our next conversation with the next fellow, uh, Latanya La Autry, who is a wonderful curator in Ohio who's been um, doing some important work and expect her email exhibition this Sunday. Um, so if you have, want to receive those, um, you can just uh, subscribe to the Hyperallergics email um, list and we will be sending those out. And thank you again, Tani, this was a total pleasure. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. <laughs>